Dr. Turek uh, is director of the Turek Clinic, a men's health clinic in San Francisco. He is a former professor of urology, obstet obstetrics, and gynecology at the UCSF, um, and held the Academy of Medical Education Endowed Chair in Urology Education. Dr. Turek attended, uh, I think I keep saying that wrong, Turek? Sorry. <laughs> Attended Yale College, followed by Stanford University Medical School. After a urology residency at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Turek was fellowship trained at Baylor College of Medicine. His 175 publications include basic research that focuses on germ and st stem cell genetics and epidemiologic studies of men's sexual and reproductive health problems. Uh, Problems. He is on the advisory board of the National Men's Health Care Network and the NIH Reproductive Medicine Network. He is also the editor of the reproductive volume of Nutter's Images uh, and oversees an active blog on men's health issues. Uh, he recently founded a volunteer medical clinic powered by retired physicians for the working uninsured. And with that, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Turek. Thank you, Mina. I want to thank, are you mic'd okay? Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, HR, for bringing me to Google. It's my first time. I'm very excited. Um, and I want to teach you a little bit about your life. So I, if you have, this might be a sensitive lecture, so if you do have questions, uh, you're welcome to send it to a hashtag, a hashtag or a tweet at the Turret Clinic. If you want to do that, we'll answer those for you. If you want a copy of the slides, do likewise, please. Mina went over this with Google Health, which I think actually is a great initiative. Google Health, one of the problems in men's health, and I'm going to generalize to men's health, is that men don't get great care, and Google Health allows you to own it more. So I'm a real fan of, and would like to get involved with Google Health on, the, on that level. So why was I asked to speak? Well, I am a microsurgeon, and I am a urologist, and I am a fellowship-trained men's health specialist, and I'm pretty well known in the field, but that's not why I was asked. I was asked to speak because I care. I care about you. I care about the kind of care that men are getting in America right now. I have developed inventions to find sperm from a rock and fertile men and get them pregnant, help them get pregnant and lead better lives. I have patented inventions. We have stem cell technology coming out where we can take a skin biopsy potentially in the future, make it into a stem cell, make it into a sperm in a dish. So you get that little kid with leukemia who can't conceive when he's an adult, and you can give him the option of fatherhood. So there's a lot of wild stuff going on. I am developing an artificial testicle to help that happen with some great scientists. So these are the things I'm working on. And I'm also going to the government a lot, because they asked me to come to Washington in the middle of winter, and it's kind of cold and windy there, and they say, where's men's health going, and what should we be doing? And I give them my opinion, and I'll give you some of that opinion today, because it needs to change. Because essentially, the problem is that men are underserved. Men your age are underserved. So who has a car? Most of you. Who gets the oil changed on their car regularly? Okay. Who's been to a doctor in the last one year? Wow. Okay, didn't work. <laughs> So, so typically, men take better care of their cars than they do their bodies. And, you know, the, you guys are proving me wrong. But so congratulations is what I would say to that. But men have issues, and typically they don't get great care for those issues. And they don't reach out very well. So men are terrible at reaching out, unlike women. They do not have a monthly biology to respond to. So they don't get great care for lots of reasons. And I'm just here to say that I care, and I have a program for you. So this is the traditional view of men's health in America. Uh, there's sexual health, which is kind of an orbiting, an orb, next to the mothership or mother planet of overall health, and they're relatively disconnected. So I look at it as kind of rotating around overall health as this isolated orb of sexual health, which is actually a lot of the issues of young men, their sexual health issues. But, and that's what's been going on. And that has fragmented care for men in America. Because what happens is there's no ownership. So an internist might take care of A, an endocrinologist B, 
a dermatologist see, but no one really owns the package of men, unlike a gynecologist who does the breast exam and does a lot of the typical things that women need periodically. So that's the problem in America. There's no ownership of care of, of, care of men. So it's all fragmented. And I think that needs to change. And we're doing that. And what needs to change is we need to bring sexual health into the planet of the whole planet or realm of overall health. And I'm going to prove to you today that it belongs there, that your sexual health is as important as your overall health and is integral to overall health. And you've got a lot of initiatives here at Google. You heard a mindfulness talk yesterday, stress reduction. Um, they feed you. You know, they encourage you to stand. The ergonomics team will help you stand instead of sitting because they'll live longer that way. Lots of things are going on. It's beautiful. This is what we want. So what is sexual health? It's kind of blurry, but the WHO, the World Health Organization, calls it the integration of the physical, emotional, intellectual, and social aspects of sexual being. That's really it. So here's a cloud tag I put together on the topics I want to talk about under the realm of sexual health and their relative frequency. So ejaculation disorders are really number one for young men. And sexual desire disorders, libido, is really number two. And you're going to learn more about those than you ever cared to learn today. But these are important things that matter to men and affect their quality of life. So first start off, how is a man like a vintage Maserati? So in this crowd, it's different because you actually probably take care of yourselves as well as a vintage Maserati. And uh, I was going to offer you, if you said, if no one raised their hands when I said, do you, take, do you go to the doctor once a year? Have you been in the last year? I would have said, how many of you would sign up for my men's health tune-up if I put it on Google offerings when it comes out? But you guys are already doing a good job. But sign up for it anyway. Um, so, so like the Geico caveman, okay? So men are immortal. You're immortal. You hardly ever think about things. You take great abuse, long hours, fluorescent lights, sitting, uh, overclock computer, you have no signs of failure, basically. And, but when you do fall, you fall hard. So it takes a lot to keep you sick, to keep you at home. But you, you stay home, and it's usually a big hit. A vintage Maserati, when it runs, it runs hard. They run really well. It gobbles up terrible roads. It can eat you know, miles and miles really fast. But the gauges may not work. So it's hard to tell if something's going wrong. And the metal may bend quietly and then break, which is similar to the man. So these are pretty good analogies. And you'll see me running through the caveman analogy and the old car analogy quite a bit. Because I do think that everyone needs a tune-up. Now, in this talk, I, I've got these blog posts written. That's at TurekOnMensHealth.com. It's a blog I write weekly. And this one's called The Sound of the Fury. But if you see that, then it'll talk a lot about that and expand on it for you. It's at TurekOnMensHealth.com. And love your input. So let's talk about erections, near and dear to everyone's heart at your age. Um, this is Massachusetts male aging study, which is impressive because it showed us that it was done on a, a cross-sectional population of, of uh, men in Massachusetts and all different kinds of men. And it, looked, it showed that basically erectile dysfunction occurs in everybody, almost at every age group, you'll find erectile dysfunction, trouble with erections. And the second thing is it goes up as you get older. So in this graph, white means basically no problem, and yellow, orange, and red mean there is a problem. And you can see the proportion of the graph with yellow, orange, and red goes way up as you go down on the graph. And so even at age 40, which is when the study started, there are half the men were having problems with erections, half. And you can extrapolate that to 30. It's pretty linear. You can see at 30 there are going to be people too. So this is, this is an epidemic. This is not minor stuff. This is an epidemic. So let's go over the erection a little bit. I'm sorry if you're eating lunch and seeing this slide, but <laughs> this is a cross-section of, of the member. And um, this is how it's built. So there's an artery down the middle, and the erection starts by the artery dilating. So from left to right, you'll see it dilate. And then that fills these lacunar spaces in the penis, which give you tumescence or engorgement. And those are called sinusoids. And then the sinusoids, when they fill, slap the vein shut against the wall of the penis and close off or cork off the flow of blood out of the penis so it stays in. So it's very mechanical, 
very mechanical system. And that's called venous compression. So, but I like this analogy. I think you should think about it as a sink. So the, the arterial inflow is the faucet. And the venous outflow and the sinusoids are the sink itself. And the drain is the venous leak, is the ve are the veins that drain. So to get a good erection, you would follow the green curve there, where you get, it, it quickly fills up and it stays full. That's a sink with a good seal and a good inflow. But a lot of problems, a lot of times you may have problems with the drain. So you, you know, have a kitchen sink and the drain's not tight. And you get the yellow curve shows an erection that occurs quickly but falls quickly because it's draining out. That's very common. And the red curve is an erection that takes a while to get because the faucet's weak. But once you get it, you're okay. And those are three typical patterns that demonstrate the mechanics of this. But what else is going on with the penis? So that's the mechanical issues, but the erection is not an isolated event. The problems with erections is not just a simple mechanical problem. Because men with erectile dysfunctions, we now know, this is established science, have twice the high, in their 40s or so, have twice the risk of heart attacks as they go to older than men who don't. And that risk, increased risk of heart disease with an erection problem as a younger person is the same risk as a smoker or someone in your family who has a heart problem. Same risk. That's pretty important. I call that a biomarker. Women have periods and they have cycles and they go to doctors when they're irregular. Men with an erection problem, bing, 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 that's a sign. That's a biomarker, something not right. Yeah, it has to do with mechanics, but there's some larger issues going on. Yes. Uh, what is between the positive relationship with the heart attack and TV? Wait. I'll get to it. Anybody who believes that the way to a man's stomach, way to a man's heart is through his stomach is flunking geography, okay? It's not. So the answer to your question is here. These are conditions that are well established and influence erections. So up here in this corner, the upper left-hand corner, are the metabolic syndrome risk factors, right? Obesity, heart disease, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes. That's the metabolic syndrome feature. So they're all, throughout this talk, they'll be up in the upper left-hand corner. Sleep, stress. Stress is a type A personality, et cetera. There aren't any type A personalities here, I'm sure. Medications, um, organ failure, low testosterone. Alcohol and drugs. Alcohol is fabulous. So alcohol, um, you see these young guys come in and they have, an, they have a problem with intercourse or whatever. And what happens is you're on a date. You're at the bar and you, get a, you pound a couple of stouts and you see a woman or a man and you like them and you say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something to them. But you need those beers to get it done because what alcohol does is it socially uninhibiting. So you're pretty, pretty nervous about it. You'll get relaxed. Your libido, your sex drive will go up, and you'll say, I'm going to do it. And you go over there, and it works out really well. And later that evening, you go to use the device. You go to, you go to and you'll have the activity, and it's numb as anything because alcohol is a local anesthetic. It's an anesthetic. That's what we gave people when we were cutting off arms and legs in the Civil War before we had anesthesia, alcohol and a bullet. It's great. So it actually numbs the signal. And it's almost sometimes almost impossible to keep an erection if you have a lot of alcohol on board because it's, your sensations are, are changed. So, so it's a two-edged sword. But this is um, well-established stuff. So you can see this is very much a part of overall health. An erection problem is very much a part of overall health. And when I see a man, and I'm pretty convinced it's a real erection problem, at the Turk Clinic, what I will do is I will evaluate him for metabolic syndrome. I will do those, those things because I need to, we need to own it, and I'm not going to send you to a medical doctor to do it. I'm going to do it and take care of it and try to get, get that under control. And taking care of those risk factors will improve the erection. So men with heart disease, sort of, you know, it's all one big blood vessel, but heart disease patients who have poor erections, if you can help their heart disease out, they'll get better erections. So you can actually improve things. So let me summarize. So erections are common. Erectile dysfunction is very common. Your age, 31, 32, 40. 
It can be a marker of heart disease if it's real, and there's a way to figure out whether it's real. What I real is, is really an organic problem, or is this just a stress, a stress-related situational problem? I, and that's really easy to differentiate with one visit. And then erectile dysfunction is related to overall health. That's really important. So you need to take care of your overall health. You need to eat well. You need to sleep well. You need to exercise. You need to go to the massage and yoga classes here. You need to stand when you're at your desk. You need to do the things that Google Health is, is trying to convince you to do, and they're doing a great job of it, and take ownership. Let's talk about something more common than an erection problem, which is a sex drive problem. There's very, very little science here, but, but clinically I treat this all the time. It's probably the most common thing a young man would come in for besides an infertility problem. What is it? The desire to have sex it's basically, it's been called an urge that's instinctual, biological, or primitive. That's how basic this definition is. What's true about it, I think clinically, is that levels vary widely among individuals. So often a couple gets together and the, ma the one partner and the other partner have very different ideas of how often they should have sex. And you'll see this in a marriage, you'll see that and it's very different. And, and, and that is one of the hardest parts it's, more, it's harder than the dishwasher thing where you're putting dishes away and you say, am I going to do this for the rest of my life? Am I going to be putting the dishes away and what, you know, as the guy in the relationship? It's one of those things. How do you solve that problem? Well, it kind of works itself out. kind of works itself out. But, but you do have to deal with it because people are different. Women for men, men for each other, etc. But within an individual, the pattern is pretty characteristic of the sex drive, frequency of wanting it, et cetera, the desire, the urge. There can be er times of deadlines and, and stress where it might, it might not be as high. And it's not linked to testosterone levels. So the guy in the porno flick who's got it all, who wants it all the time, doesn't have a higher testosterone than the guy somewhere else who isn't in that situation. And the question is, can oysters improve it? And for that, you'll have to go to the blog, Oysters, Men, and Sex. So here are two men with their patterns of, of sex drive. So the man on the top in the green uh, basically has a high sex drive and it's constant. The man on the lower part is lower sex drive and it varies a little bit, but it's got a pattern to it. And those are both normal. Those are both normal. What's not normal for me is when a man has a pattern that is changing. And changing can be it was high, and, and literally last August, um, middle of the month, all of a sudden it dropped through the roof. It dropped through the, to the floor. That would be abnormal. I jump on that one. I look for an issue there. And the second one would be, it's just getting, it varies a little bit, but it's getting a lot worse over time. And that's something that should be pursued medically. Why? The usual suspects. The usual suspects. Overall health, right? There's our metabolic component in the upper left-hand corner. Low testosterone is a part of this. Stress is a huge part of this. Sleep is a huge part of this. Alcohol and drugs, et cetera, travel, circadian stress can all affect this. And prolactin, the guy who dropped off, off the face of the earth with a sex drive, you, there's a good chance you're going to find a benign brain tumor in that guy if you check his blood test for prolactin. That's not a cancer. It does need treatment. That's a health problem. So I respect libido. I respect it, and you should respect it and try to own it. Let's talk about sleep. So what does sleep affect? Well, sleep is really important. Does it kill you not to sleep? Probably not, but there are studies going on that show that mortality is lower in men who don't sleep well. Uh, same with low testosterone and same with stress. They're not strong. They're epidemiologic studies. But it does affect lots of things on this graph. So obesity, your eat dietary habits, your stress, testosterone, diabetes, high blood pressure, it's a stressor. So let's talk about sleep. This is the National Sleep Foundation. It's an ongoing annual survey on the web. And the graph shows the number of hours slept per night in 2010 by people in America. So 40, half the people in America who answered the survey are, say they're not great sleepers. 10 to 15% say they never get good sleep. They get an average of six hours and 30 minutes of sleep. How many hours did you get last night? Six hours and 30 minutes of sleep. What's considered physiologically important for an adult is seven to nine hours. For most, everyone's different. Good sleepers, if you looked at that subgroup, they tend to get 
an hour more than the sleepers who aren't sleeping well. And every generation, humans get one hour less sleep a night. Welcome to the information age. Stay connected. So awake is the new sleep. Short sleep has been linked to definitively, as that graph showed, depression, obesity, heart disease, and attention disorders. So it's subtle, but it's real. Sleep is important. What do you do about sleep then? And what do you do about the sex drive and sleep? Less caffeine, less alcohol. Those are disruptors of, of rhythms and things. Less Red Bull. Exercise. Take those bicycles from building to building on campus. Eat dinner early. Don't fill late in the day so your met metabolism has changed. And, take, and relax after work. So that would be an e-book, a tub, something where you kind of get your body down. Exercise would be great. And keeping a sleep schedule is really important. Anyone with kids will know. Kids smile in the morning if they're on a schedule. They look great in the morning. I mean, if you keep them off their schedule, your, your life is a mess. It's the same with you. You're basically a big kid. I mean, basically, your body does better on a schedule. So if it's a Saturday and you always get up at 7 or 8, get up at 7 or 8, hit the clock, and then go back to sleep. But, still, but wake up like when you normally keep on that schedule, and then maybe you can go down a little bit afterwards to sleep in. But it's not bad to do that. Um, so it's really important. You know, Olympic athletes know this. Anyone who practices anything at a high level, microsurgery, it's all about the schedule. I mean, I do, I do surgery on things that you can't see by eye. And so I don't go play tennis and pull my shoulder the night before a microsurgery case. Because if I'm in pain, that causes a tremor. If I have a tremor, that's not as good a procedure for me. So I, you have to take care of things. Sleep aids and medications, I put them at the bottom. Not a first-line approach to things, but they can help enormously. And there's a nice blog called No Sex, Get Some Sleep, How It Can Improve Your Sex Life. I actually wrote one to the royal couple. And I said, you know, I know the, the invitation probably got lost in the mail, but I'll give you some advice anyway, William. Um, you know, get some sleep, you guys. You've got a busy life, but, you know, take care of yourselves. So it's one of those blogs. Stress. Central central to your life, central to your sexual life, central to your overall health. Affects almost everything, okay, and is affected by things. So what about libido and stress? So here you are, the gecko, gecko caveman, and you're, and I have no relationship to gecko, by the way. Um, you're the gecko caveman, and your body, when were we cavemen? 200,000 years ago? Pleistocene era, right? And your nervous system is basically identical to that. Right? But your stressors are not woolly mammoths chasing you anymore. So when you're chased by a woolly mammoth, what do you think happens to your erection? It's going to fall because you've got to get out of there. Okay? Right? What happens to your sex drive? Is that a time to have sex? No. Get out. Okay? You have the same nervous system. So what's your stressor? There are no woolly mammoths. So ours are physical. So long work days. Um, Sleep-wake cycles, so emotional stressors. We have financial stressors, especially in the Bay Area. And travel stress, so travel is a great form of stress. You're traveling to Europe all the time, Google London. You know, that could be a problem because you're not, your clock is not resetting. You have a pineal gland that likes a rhythm. And that changes all the levels of things. So you should know your woolly mammoths on this situation. So what do you do? So that is the sympathetic nervous system. And I just saw a great poster out here in your lobby. Massage. Great for your parasympathetic nervous system. I thought, God, they know the name. They know the names of the nervous systems. That's great. I thought, you never see that anywhere else. You know, it's not relaxed. It's like it's great for your parasympathetic <laughs> nervous system at Google. Okay. So this is the sympathetic. I'll talk to you that way. This is the sympathetic nervous system. Right? So this is the fight or flight. That's the stress one. No woolly mammoths, but whatever they are, they may be small. You may not even know them. But you want the parasympathetic nervous system, and that's how you get it, exactly. Massage, exercise, acupuncture, or yoga. Men are terrible at figuring out if they're stressed or not. They're terrible. I have to ask them things like, how many times do you wake up at night wor worried about something at work? You know, that, that's the kind of question, and that's an extreme example of it. But that's, what, that's how men sort of gauge it. But these are fabulous ways to reduce your stress. Get your body tired. So more profound and stressful than 
libido or erections in a lot of couples is infertility in people your age, especially because it involves a partner. So that's an important thing to talk about as a sexual health issue. And it's defined as the inability to conceive after a year. However you want to define it, whatever position you want, one year. Okay? And it's a very simple evaluation at the Turek Clinic. We do it all the time. One visit and maybe a phone call. Okay? We do a personal and family history, 220-question questionnaire, a good physical exam, like a doctor does, a semen analysis, and then potentially a hormone evaluation. That's just a picture of the room that we collect semen in at work, which is you know, taken after Google. It's a Wi-Fi, cordless, it's insulated, uh, very efficient. It's been in a couple magazines, and there's a play written after it called Sperm Warfare, which is going to be made into a movie. And it's uh, very much a headache movie because you, you watch and it's all the problems that could happen to a guy in a collection room who can't get it done. Like the woman, the wife or partner is calling him and saying, come on, is it done? Is it done? And the phone's in there. And, and the nurse comes through and he's like, oh, you know, should I ask her to help? You know, and, and all these things. And then she, he says to her, you know, maybe you just want me for my DNA. I, I don't really want to do this. You just want me for my DNA. But anyway, it's a great little show. It'll probably be coming out soon. Um, but if you ask me what's the most important thing, Everyone would say, it's got to be the semen analysis, right? No, it's not. It's the personal and family history. Semen analysis, unless it's zero, is irrelevant, almost irrelevant. It's really the history of that patient. So um, why is that important? Because look at this, the usual suspects. Look what underlies male infertility. There's very little difference between this and erections. The metabolic syndrome group is up there. That's building 41 here. The, uh, you know, you have heart disease, testosterone, stress, sleep, all of it. It's all part of it. And that's all part of the personal history. That's really important. So your infertility could be due to stress. It could be due to other mechanical problems. It could be due to medical illness. It's not an orb rotating some other place. It's part of your health. It's not a separate, it's not a separate problem. So what's my advice? You make 1,000 sperm per heartbeat, that's busy, right? That's busy. 1,000 sperm per heartbeat, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Almost like your income here. Um, <laughs> testicles, they want to run fast. This is an engine, right? It's an engine, and it's running hard all the time. What you can do to it is bring it down. So all these things slow it down. It's like diluting the gas or... Something, flattening the tires. You're doing something to the car to slow it down. It wants to run fast. It needs to run fast, right? You're built for this. So have respect for small things in great numbers, like ants, sperm. Eat well, sleep well, exercise, reduce your stress. The mantra. The mantra of Google Health, the mantra here. Treat your body well and keep the engine running. Does anyone know what kind of engine that is? Anyone a car guy? There you go. There you go. You know, I like because they show it off. You should show off the parts. It's a mechanical thing. Show it off. Everyone covers it with plastic now. It's not, it's not the way to do it. So there's another thing about infertility that I've been very interested in the past 15 years as a researcher is that I think it, it's good to know about it because it's a biomarker. Like erections are a biomarker of health. The semen analysis is a biomarker of health. It can, it's treatable, so it can re reveal underlying conditions. Those conditions can be treatable and should be treated in some situations. And you can avoid technology, like in vitro fertilization tests to baby and that stuff. And it may be a window into future health. It may be a window, and it may be a true biomarker. So we did a study where we looked at the ability of infertile men to repair their DNA. So here's the car analogy all over again. You have a car, you drive it to work, you drive it home, you go in, and all those dents you pick up from the parking lot, when it's in the garage, those go away. There's, it gets fixed up overnight, and it comes out the next day shiny and clean. That's what your body does a million times a day. You get exposed to sun, et cetera, and your body, your body repairs its DNA breaks. If it couldn't do it, you'd have cancer, skin cancer, eye cancer, all that stuff. That's the two-hit theory of cancer. You can't repair the second hit. You can't repair the hit that, that occurred with the first. So you have these systems in place called DNA polymerase, nucleotide excision repair, DNA mismatch repair, and they take the dents out of your DNA every day. Okay? And there's some mice that you can knock out some of these genes that control these things, mismatch repair genes, and you can 
mate them and create transgenic mice. And you look at these mice, and a couple of papers came out 10 years ago where they made this great knockout, and they looked at it and it got cancer. So the knockout mice got cancer. And they said, great, now we have a model for colon cancer. But what the problem was they were also infertile. So we looked at these at Journal Club at UCSF and said, that's odd. So the first manifestation was the infertility, and then they got cancer because they had this problem. So that's a problem for a transgenic. You spend a million dollars to make a mouse with a gene that's missing, and you can't reproduce it. So what do you do? You write a ton of papers about the infertility. So they did. And we saw these pictures of their testicles, the biopsies, and I said, God, I have guys just like that. They just, they look just like that. So we took the guys who had testicle biopsies that looked like these mice and got their blood and got their sperm and did all, and all this stuff. And we looked at them very carefully, and we looked at the source of the problem, which is called meiosis. Remember meiosis? High school? Biology? Maybe college? Chromosomes get together, they recombine, and then they leave, and that's a new individual. It's different than mitosis, which is the rest of your body, which is don't make a mistake, don't change, let the gametes do the changing. Evolution is all about your gametes. So we looked at the fidelity of the process in these men versus, versus normal men. And what we're finding is, you can't see these, but there's little yellow nodules, dots on these chromosomes that are painted with uh, stains. And some people are missing those dots or the dots aren't made well. And those dots are recombination nodules that repair problems. So those, those are the nodules that go in and pull the dent out, the suction cup that pulls the dent out of your car at night. And then it says, okay, we're fine, let's keep going. And they had faulty meiosis. So they were, they were bad. And so we said, oh my God. So it came out and The Economist wrote an article about this paper we published and said, are you telling me that these guys are all going to get cancer? Or, I mean, we have something, are we passing off men with infertility as cancer farms? Are they going to have kids with cancer? I said, you know, we don't know. But quality control is very high in this system. So, so I don't really worry about it. But then 10 years later, an, a, a great fellow came into, into the department who was an epidemiologist, and we said, we have a fabulous database of infertility patients in California, 55,000 or 40,000, and a fabulous cancer registry. So we did a really nice epidemiologic study. We just looked at, over 30 years, the guys who were infertile, and it was based on a semen analysis, and we said, are they at higher risk for cancer if they're infertile and if the infertility is due to a male factor? And we did. We found it. So in this study, we found that all men, the standard incidence ratio just means relative to the population of normal healthy Californians at the time. It's 30% higher, but not significant. This crosses one. So all, infertile, all men in the study, all a part of infertile couples, their rate of cancer, testis cancer, after infertility. This is later disease, not at the same time, later disease. But if they had a male factor infertility, it was threefold higher. And if they didn't have a male factor infertility, so the infertility was the female issue, then it was the same. So that's a nice control. There's a control and there's a control, negative controls. And cancer was threefold higher, perfectly consistent with European data. First data in America, that was real. And then we took a negative cancer like prostate cancer, which is late in life, same thing. It was twofold higher. I'm like, now what do we do? So what's going on? I don't know what's going on, but this worries me, and it means that infertility may be a biomarker. So here you go on your life. You start out here, born at a young age. You spend some time at Microsoft. Facebook's old. You come to Google. And then maybe something else happens, like infertility. And the question is, what else is going to happen? Because that's the first marker, and you don't know that. But this is where I think the government should be spending money on how is this a biomarker of health. What about testis cancer? This is near and dear to my heart. I'm an advisor to Lance Armstrong Foundation, um, and I, I think this is an incredible story. But this is the most common cancer in your age group, essentially. It does go down at 35. There's another peak at 50. But, you know, I asked UCSF medical students who are in their 20s who are supposed to be health conscious, you know, how many of you do testicular self-examinations once a month in the shower? Nobody. Or nobody admitted it, but nobody. And that's sad, because that's really easy to do. And these, ca these cancers are rising, 3 to 6% per year in America, per year, and elsewhere in Europe, much higher. And what is really gnaws at me is the, and this is the men's health thing, 
the average delay in the diagnosis from when the man knows there's an issue that's not normal to when he gets care is 12 to 24 weeks. That's three to four, three to, three to six months. Three to six months. For a cancer, that's a big deal. But we know the risk factors. We know the risk factors. There's a family history now. If your testicles not descended at birth, that puts you at risk factor. And pot use is a risk factor, believe it or not. And it's curable, very curable if you catch it early. Um, and self-examination is a fabulous way to pick it up early. I had a patient a couple of months ago who found it and just found a little bit of difference between his testicles. And I said, you know, congratulations. You know, I basically took it out, put a fake one in there. He didn't miss a beat. And he's cured. He's cured based on one, one procedure. Not a pleasant one, but it's one. So there's a blog on the pot one if you want to know more called Weed Worries. How about this one? Have you ever heard about this one? Ejaculation. It's not in your head. It's not in your head. This is, ejaculation is a spinal reflex. This is a reflex from the spinal cord, like a sneeze. It's the only two reflexes you can't control. Once they go, they go, right? It's a spinal reflex. You can tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> but there's disorders of this, which are very interesting, that you can be early, early ejaculation, which is a question of, you know, What's early? It's, we're starting to define it. It can be late. It may not happen. It may be very difficult. That's true. It can be dry. Everything's working, but it just nothing comes out. Or it can be absent. It's just never developed. And those are very treatable conditions. I don't know if there are health risks with them. So I don't know if this is a general health, but you know, a quality of life issue, you bet. It's, it's a really good quality of life. Very treatable. I treat them all the time. They don't even involve pills. Some of it's just behavioral training. Contraception. Okay, you're in the bar. You're doing well. You're at Google. You know, you got it all. There's a lot of reward. And there's some risk. Right? You're out there. There's some risk of being out there. Contraception is important. So here are your choices. You can use condoms. You can use rhythm method. What the hell is that? You can use withdrawal. There's a great blog on that. Pulling out is in. You can abstain, always works. Uh, vasectomy, a little invasive, I, I like them. But And then there's the male pill, which we'll talk in for a minute about. But the number one for STD, sexually transmitted disease, is a condom. And that's a 2% failure rate, and that's a pretty good way. Withdrawal, believe it or not, in studies, works really well. Everyone worries about the first part of the ejaculate having sperm, but in fact, it's a 4% failure rate. It's basically like a condom. It's pretty good, and everybody uses it. You know, but there aren't many people who conceive with withdrawal. I don't know if I'd recommend it, but but it's um, but it is quite good, and men get pretty good at it. Vasectomy, absolutely the surest, best form of contraception. No compliance issues. You're done. You're done. Seven minute procedure. Come to the office. Get your diploma. Congratulations. It's a good one. The Tura Clinic. The male pill. What's happening with male pill? Well, it's probably not going to happen because ethnic there's ethnic variations in men. And there is compliance issues with men, and men aren't women. And pharma or pharmaceutical industries are not really interested in anything with a risk like this. It's like taking a pill to prevent a heart attack, and you get a heart attack. They're just not that interested. So there's been 30 years of research, and the hormonal contraceptives are being developed in labs, but pharma, the pharmaceutical industry is not really interested. That's kind of the latest. And so there probably won't be a male pill. What about... The other sexual health issue is, you know, you go to the bar, you come back, do you want the nightmare reminder of that, of that evening? And this is the most unwanted list. This was provided by the CDC in Atlanta to me for this talk. And basically, number one are the viruses. So genital herpes and the herpes virus. Gen so genital warts and the herpes virus are number one and two. And those are literally 25 percenters of reproductive age people. They're not curable either. Although there is a vaccine now for genital warts called Gardasil, which came out, which works really well, but it's not for people with the problem. It's for currently 9- to 13-year-old pre-sexually active women to prevent the uh, contraction of warts, which can lead to cervical cancer. It's not approved for men, although that's sort of being discussed. Should, should you give it to young boys, too? This is preventative. It's a vaccine, essentially. So once you have it, it's not, it doesn't help. But you do control it clinically, and then it doesn't become infectious, and it's not really a problem. But chlamydia is on the rise. That's the college one. You know, and that's going up. 
Uh, gonorrhea and HIV are on the decline, which is good. And syphilis. Probably don't, you probably don't know what syphilis is. It's so old, but syphilis is on the rise too. And so that's, that's something to think about. And these are things that you have to think about. Here's syphilis in California. Who does it occur in? Reproductive age men. Where is it occurring in California? Bing, 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 bing. I mean, that's probably what? Most of the Google campus right there, right? <laughs> so the best advice is the oldest advice. You take your history with you when you go into a relationship. So be safe. Pretty plain and simple. Hormones. So everyone talks about testosterone, this or that. You know, is testosterone important? It's got a bad act with the sports and stuff, but it is very important. It's very important. It, it is good for your heart. It's good for your muscle. It reduces your fat. It keeps your blood counts up. It prevents depression. It is an elixir. Uh, it doesn't get you the car, but it's good for your bones. It's good for maintaining your sexual health, too, and maintaining that area. So it is important. And what else, what's influencing testosterone? Look at the same actors, basically. Metabolic syndrome, diabetes, thyroid, overall health in the body. Testosterone is a rest and restore molecule. If you're running from a woolly mammoth, you'd think it'd be higher if you're a really good athlete, and it's not because it's a molecule that rebuilds you when you've done the run. So when you're running from the woolly mammoth, that's adrenaline. But when you sit down and start and take a couple of breaths, that's when your testosterone kicks in. So it's really an anabolic hormone, more of a rest and restore one. So stress kills it. Does it do a body good? Absolutely. It's the elixir of life. You have to have a good level of it. Is it the root cause of your problems? Probably not. Is replacement the holy grail? No. Testosterone replacement is not the holy grail. You can read the blog, A Sword with Two Edges. Maybe it was for him, maybe not. I don't know. You decide on Schwarzenegger. This is the fact, though, about testosterone. It's probably whatever you put on this curve, if this is the, you know, the computer and you want your computer to be overclocked, and you're doing that, and you, you think more testosterone will help your body computer, what happens, what people think is that more is better, and you're just going to get stronger, this, 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 more, more, more. It's not the way it works. It's probably a saturation curve. You get a normal level, and at that point, you're not going to improve much. It's going to be saturated. So that's probably what's going on with testosterone. I call it, here's the truth curve. Okay? That's it. That's my advice about these simple sexual health issues. You need to think about them. You need to take ownership of them. I will help you do that. The medical system right now isn't very good at that because everyone's got their own little expertise, but you are an individual and it is all one big happy family inside of you. These issues called sexual health issues are lead indicators of health and they are lead predictors of future health. So there, and this is what most of my time with the government is spent doing, trying to get grants to go in this direction for men. And not only that, treatment will really improve your quality of life. So it is really, these are important things. I want to thank some organizations for helping out with this talk. It's through their advice that, you know, that I have uh, told you a lot of this. So NIH helped out and the CDC and a couple of professional organizations that uh, I'm a member of have, I've had people contribute to this talk. So I want to thank you for your time. Again, for uh, if you have questions and you don't want to talk about them here or you want the slides for the talk, um, there's the hashtag and at and the Twitter is the Turret Clinic. Thank you very much.